Good morning. Happy Book Week Scotland. This is a week where we're celebrating reading and the best of Scottish books. Um, it's a cold, wet November morning, but we're going to brighten it up by stepping inside a very magical place with one of our favourite authors. So let's welcome our guest author, Ross McKenzie, and we're going to step inside the Other Wear Emporium. Welcome, Ross. Hi. Hi. How are Thanks you? for having me on. You? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Happy Book Week Scotland, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> so it's a shame we can't have you in a library with a live audience, but it's lovely to have you here. And um, I called it the Other Way Emporium, but it's not really called the Other Way Emporium. But this final book here, the Other Way Emporium, is mm -hmm. your last book in the trilogy of the No Way Emporium. So can you tell some of the pupils who haven't read the book yet what this is all about? Absolutely. Absolutely. So... The Other Way Emporium follows the continuing adventures of Daniel Holmes and his magical shop, the Nowhere Emporium. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Nowhere Emporium is, it's a, it's a shop filled with magic and filled with wonder. And inside the Emporium, you know, it, well, first of all, it, it appears, um, it goes from town to town, city to city, appearing from nowhere, hence the name Nowhere Emporium. And uh, Daniel invites his customers in to... Uh, to see all the wonders within the Emporium. Inside the Emporium is a huge <clears throat> labyrinth, a huge carnival of wonders. And um, Daniel invites his customers in to experience all these wonders, goes from town to town, city to city. And this is the continuing adventures of Daniel and his magical shop. So in the other way, Emporium, we introduce uh, a few new characters. Uh, most importantly, we have Mirren, who is the, um, the hero of our story. Um, and Mirren... Um, as we will find out, is sort of drawn into the Nowhere Emporium when her mum goes missing. And as the story unfolds, we sort of, we learn a little bit about Mirren's mum and her backstory and her history and that she has a connection to the Emporium as well. And um, we follow Mirren and her friends as they adventure through the Emporium, trying to find her mum and uncover the secrets of her mum's past. So that's all I can really tell you without giving too much away about the plot of the new book. Could you read us a little section of the book, Ross? Absolutely. Absolutely, I can. So this is, um, I'm going to read you chapter six. It's called The White Feather. And um, Mirren has come home from school uh, and found that her mum is gone. Now, this isn't an entirely unusual event because her mum and... Uh, as, as a single parent, she works long hours and sometimes she has to go out and start a shift while Mirren's still at school. So Mirren is used to coming home and, and her mum not being there. But um, as the night goes on and she has no word from her mum, she can't reach her by phone or through text or anything, she starts to worry that her mum, you know, she, she, she just starts to kind of think that it's not, it's, it's not the usual sort of scenario that they find themselves in. And then one, yeah, that night, uh, during, the, during the night, Mirren's phone goes off and she looks at the screen and she sees a strange caller ID. And this is where we're going to start the reading from. So, Mirren continued to stare at the strange caller ID flashing on the screen of her phone. It said, nowhere. Was this a prank call? She tried letting it ring until the caller either hung up or the answer phone kicked in. None of these things happened. After a few minutes, the phone was still ringing and vibrating, even after she tried to switch it off. Seemingly with no other choice, Mirren Feather put the phone to her ear and answered. Hello? A pause. The line was bad. Hello? Mirren repeated. Another pause and the hiss of faraway static. Then someone answered. Mirren? said a male voice. Mirren sat up straight. Who's this? I don't have time to explain everything, said the voice. You must listen carefully. Your mum is in trouble. A jolt of panic. Mirren swung her legs around, sat on the edge of the bed in the soft turquoise glow of the nightlight. What's happened to mum? Has there been an accident at work? The line crackled and hissed again. She's not at work, Mirren. She's somewhere else. She's trapped in my shop and she needs your help. I need your help. Mirren stood up, began to pace around the room. 
What do you mean stuck in your shop? Where is she? What's happened to her? He's going to cut me off soon, said the voice hurriedly. I might go at any moment, man, and this is going to sound mad, but please believe me when I tell you that every word I'm about to say is the absolute truth. I am a magician, a good magician. My shop, the Nowhere Emporium, has been taken over by an evil magician. He's keeping your mum prisoner. Mirren held the phone away from her face, stared at the screen in disbelief. Then a thought occurred to her. Oh, very funny, Lucas. You got me. Another pause. The line crackled again. Lucas, said the voice. No, no, this isn't Lucas. This isn't funny, Luke. Mirren's fear was beginning to turn to anger. I know I should have stuck up for you yesterday at lunch. I'm sorry, but that doesn't mean you can phone me in the middle of the night and frighten the life out of me. Honestly, telling me mum's in danger. I'm not Lucas, the voice pleaded. Please just look out your window, please, Mirren. She heard the fear, the desperation in the voice, and she knew she wasn't speaking to Lucas. Her heart was battering against her chest. She stared at her phone until a sound from the window made her look up, a whispering, scratching noise. Feeling like she was in a dream, Mirren crept to the window. She opened the curtains to the still darkness of the night. A single white feather was floating on the other side of the glass, suspended in the air, twirling, its hollow shaft gently scratching at the glass. At first, Mirren did nothing but stare at the feather, watching it catch the cold glow of the street lamps. Then she remembered the phone in her hand. Who are you? she asked. My name is Daniel Holmes came the voice through the hiss of static. Am I dreaming, Daniel Holmes? No, Mirren. So what you said about my mum, about her being in trouble? It's true, Mirren. She needs your help. We need your help. Mirren's throat was tight. Who is this we? My shop, Mirren, the Nowhere Emporium, and everyone in it. It's a place filled with brilliant magic, but that magic can be dangerous in the wrong hands. What does this have to do with my mum? With me? Your mum is, the line hissed and whistled, trapped inside the shop. A moment of silent terror. He's almost here. He knows where I am. Please, Mirren, come to the Nowhere Emporium. Find your mum. Follow the feather and trust the sign of the book. Please, her... The line went dead. And I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, now, without giving too much away, you've created lots of wonderful um, adventures and whole, a whole magical world inside the Nowhere mm -hmm. Emporium. So, when you're writing your last book, was it quite sad to be saying farewell to it? Um, that's a really good question, actually. It, it was, it was, and it wasn't. It was exciting to be getting to the end of the trilogy. Um, it was exciting because. I know that I'm going to write other things and I'm excited to start them. But the Emporium has been such a journey for me just as, as an author and as a person right from the start. I mean, the, the Nowhere Emporium was just this little book from a, an independent publisher in Scotland and it grew into this huge thing. I mean, with the Scottish Children's Book Award and then the Blue Peter Book Award, among others. And it just, it's become this, this huge thing and it's given me so many memories and so many amazing experiences that I could never have imagined that I'd have. So... When I got to the end of the book, I have to admit, yeah, I was a little bit emotional when I, when I, when I knew that this was mm -hmm. actually the end of the Nowhere Emporium trilogy because it, it made me reflect on everything that's happened and how it's changed my life and, and all of those things. So it was emotional. It was a little bit sad to say goodbye to these characters. But the other side of that, on, on the other side of that door um, is these new possibilities. So it's also exciting to know that I'm going to go on and write new stories and create new characters and... The Emporium will always have a special place in my heart. Let's put it that way. Yes, yeah. Well, you're certainly going out on a high with some amazing characters in this book and quite frankly, frightening. And one, I would like to know where the idea for the nightmares came from. Okay. Oh, man. So without giving too much away, uh, as you heard there in that reading, uh, Daniel Holmes has run into a spot of bother, to say the least, in, in the Emporium. And when Mirren and her friends get there eventually and they start to journey through the Emporium um, to try to find Mirren's mum, they encounter these inky, 
uh, sort of cloudy, inky, nightmarish creatures called nightmares. That's that's why they're called nightmares because I thought, you know, that I won't I won't let you know who's in control of the Emporium now, who's 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 sort of taken over and is causing this to happen. Um, but I thought to myself, you know, if if all of these things in the Emporium came from Daniel's head and they're all really um, they're all really you know vibrant and they're all imaginative and they're all filled with imagination and wonder if someone was to turn all of that stuff into the complete opposite and make them dark and make them you know make them into your worst fear then that's sort of what a nightmare is isn't it it's when your mind turns against you so Everyone who ever worked in the Emporium has, not everyone, not to give any secrets away, but the vast majority of the workers in the Emporium have been turned into these nightmare creatures. And that's why I call them nightmares, because it's the imagination, it's Daniel's imagination, and it's been used to turn to darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been used for the opposite effect of what Daniel wants it to use. So yeah. that's where the nightmares came from. Yeah, absolutely. We certainly do live up to their name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, glad um, I'm doing my job. <laughs> and a change from the other books, this last one, The Other Way Emporium, you've got three heroes in the book, really. Um, why did you choose The Power of Three? Well, I wanted this, that's a, another brilliant question. I wanted, I wanted this book to be about the power of friendship and what, what friendship can overcome. Um, so we take three characters. Um, we have, we have Mirren, uh, we have Luke, and we have Robin, and they are three very different characters. But I wanted to make it clear that while these are three basically, you know, everyday kids, and they're up against extreme odds, and they're up against magic that they've never imagined, and this this whole thing in the Emporium that they've, they've no experience with, and uh, they're up against powers they, they, they have never experienced before. But when they come together, and they work as a team, then they can overcome pretty much anything. And I wanted that to be, you know, I wanted that to be at the core of the book is this friendship. I didn't want it just to, to be Mirren going on this journey on her own. I wanted her to have help and I wanted her to, to have these friendships and these relationships with these other two kids that develop over the course of the, the plot. So the, the power of, of the three is, is absolutely something that I had in mind right from the start. I wanted this to be a, a, a book about friendship and where it can, the strength you can draw from it and where it can take you. Brilliant. It de definitely did. I thought that was a really lovely aspect of it, actually, the friendship between Luke and Robin and, and Mirren. Um, one question I wanted to ask as well, has there been the wonders that are written and created in the, the Nowhere Emporium, they're always magical and they're, just, they're, they're so amazing. Has there been one wonder that's been your favourite or one that you felt you would need the most? Oh, that is a good one. That is a really good question. Um... I, not necessarily one that I would use or need, but the wonder that has been my favourite, I think, so far is the very first wonder that Daniel ever created way back in the, the Nowhere Emporium, and that was the, the Room of Secrets, the snow globes. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, there's something magical about snow globes, right, to me anyway. And to imagine this, this huge room with this column, this honeycombed column of stone and, and every... In, in every little compartment there's a snow globe with a secret inside it just the, the imagery of that and the idea of that that people could go here and leave their secrets mm -hmm. and that has really just stuck with me all the way through I've, I've, I've loved creating all these windows it's brilliant just to let your imagination run wild and, and think okay if I had that, this magic book and I could create any room I wanted to what would I do but that that one really really stuck out to me for so I think that's still my favourite to this day. There's a couple of, there's a really nice one that um, that Mirren creates in this book. Yeah, relating I think that one. Relating to her, her, her granddad, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't spoil the surprise, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is really nice as well. But I think the, the secret, Room of Secrets, which no spoilers, it also plays a part in this book again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the Room of Secrets is probably my favourite one. Good, good. That's great. Okay, I think we've got, we've got some questions that, um, uh, some of the schools have asked. So the first question I'm going to ask you is from Primary 7 at Noble Primary in Bells Hill. And their first question is, uh, what age were you when you first started writing? 
okay, right, well, this, um, this is actually quite easy to answer. I was in primary four and I wrote my first story. See, the thing is, right, I say it's easy to answer and I'm going to, I'll try not to go in this long rambling and like, uh, uh, off, you know, I try not to get off too much the track on this answer, but I, I always like, even before I was writing books, I loved stories and I loved to tell stories and I didn't really know that I was doing it. I, I used to like comic books and I used to draw comic books and I used to uh, love to draw maps and make stories up around the maps and stuff as well when I was, when I was really little. Um, but the first proper story that I ever wrote was in a, uh, you know, at the end of the school year when you get, I don't know if it, you, you get all your, your work home with you. Mm -hmm. And we had a spelling book, a spelling jotter, and it was pretty much empty. So I brought this spelling jotter home and I thought it was amazing that I had all these blank pages to fill. And I wrote my first sort of picture book about a crocodile called Crunchy Colin way back when I was in primary four. So I would have been eight years old, something like that. Yeah. So... Yeah, about eight. That's when I, that's when I first got the, the writing bug properly. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not stopped since then, I take it? No. Well, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully, it's not. It's only got stronger. So. Okay, our next question is from Chapel Hall Primary 7-6. And they want to know, what is your favourite character that you've created and why? Oh, well, this is like, my goodness, this is like asking me, to choose between my children. <laughs> this is a tough. This is a tough question to answer. Okay, so I love. Um, there is one character that, that stands out to me above all others, and that is I wrote a book called Shadow Smith, and in Shadow Smith, there's a, a character called Amelia Pigeon, who is this mysterious. Uh, on the outside, she looks like a you know eleven or twelve year old girl. Um, and she's always wearing a yellow raincoat and Wellington boots and her hair is curly and wild. And um, she is actually not just your everyday 12 year old girl. She is very, very old and she's very powerful and she knows secrets about the world. Um, in fact, whenever there is trouble or uh, wherever there's suffering or wherever there's dark magic or bad things going on, Amelia tends to show up and try to put it right. So Amelia Pigeon is probably my favourite character that I've created because she can turn up anywhere and she's really quirky and funny and uh, I just, I just, I love, love that character. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Well, tell us a wee bit about what you're writing now. Are you Are writing something new now? You've been writing during lockdown? Oh yeah, I've been writing. Um, in fact, the other Wear Emporium, uh, that was a, quite a bit of that was, was written and edited during lockdown. And also I've been writing and editing uh, a sequel to um, my other, my, my book that came out in March this year, which was called Evernight. Mm -hmm. And sorry, February this year, which was called Evernight. So that's this one. Um, so I um, have been writing, the sequel to that is almost done. It's in the final editing stages now. It's called Feast of the Evernight. And it will be out in May next year. Okay. And beyond that, I am currently playing about with a few ideas. What we're, we're deciding what we're going to do next in terms of the next book. So we have a few ideas uh, bubbling away and I'm excited about all of them. So I think the most difficult thing is going to be choosing which one of the three or four ideas to go with next. Mm. But that's, that's the exciting part is when you start something new. That's one of the most exciting parts of the journey for me. Absolutely. So I've been working on uh, Feast of the Evernight and a couple of all little things that I can't tell you about quite yet, top secret, but very excited okay. about it. We'll keep an eye out, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. Now before we finish up, I think you've got a question you want to um, ask the audience. Yes, it's actually a challenge. Okay. It's actually a challenge. So um, you mentioned, Gillian, earlier on that um, the nightmares were, were, were really kind of um, bad guy, antagonist characters that stood out to you in this story. And one thing I get a lot of, of, of um, get a lot of tweets and I get a lot of feedback about my books. And one thing that comes up again and again is that people seem to really like the, the bad guys that I create, the, the, the antagonists. And that I'm so glad about that because I'm doing my job. If, if the bad guys stand out, then that makes the story a whole lot better because let's face it, without bad guys, you can't have good guys without, um, you know, with, without the bad guys and, and, and creating these high stakes and really putting your characters through a lot of bad stuff. 
then there's not really any story there. So the bad guys are really the ones that make that kick the story into action. They give the heroes something to fight uh, to fight against or to overcome. So my challenge to you is to create your own villain, right? And what I would say is, what people say to me is that sometimes they feel a little bit sorry for the bad guys I create, especially in there's a, my book Evernight, there's a guy called Shadow Jack in that. And he does terrible things, but there's a reason he does them. And some people have said that they end up feeling quite sorry for, for old Shadow Jack. So I think the thing to remember, and my challenge to you is, to create a villain who is not bad and evil just for being bad and evil's sake. You know, who doesn't want to take over the world just because he's bad um, or she's bad or whoever. There has to be a reason why they are doing what they are doing, right? No matter the best, best bad guys in any film or book or, or anything, um, the best bad guys, what you must remember is they believe that what they are doing is the right thing. They believe that what they are doing is justified no matter how bad and nasty their actions are. They believe that their actions are justified, that they are right. That's what makes a really good bad guy. So my challenge to you is to create a bad guy, uh, an antagonist, a villain for your story and tell us why this bad guy is bad. Tell us what motivates them to do the things that they are doing. Um, tell us what they look like, tell us a little bit about them, but just tell us why they are the way they are and create these bad guys. And if you create a really good bad guy, then you're halfway towards creating a good story. Because as we said earlier, the bad guys are the ones that really make the story tick at the end of the day. So create me some really, really excellent bad guys and I'm looking forward to seeing them. Um, and you can, you can show me on Twitter if you like. My Twitter handle is at Ross Author. And I'm really looking forward to seeing anything that you that you come up with in school, hopefully. So we'll get working on those bad guys. That's brilliant, Ross. Thank you. Yes. So we'll put more details of the challenge um, on the link for this um, for this event as well, and you can access it through our web page. But um, I'm going to have to say thank you, Ross. We're going to have to close the the red curtain on the Nowhere Emporium. <laughs> Oh. It's sad. I, I have loved this trilogy myself, read it Thank over you. the years, and it was, but you've definitely went out on a high. It's such a great read. If you haven't read it, definitely get hold of it and read, read the, the, final, the final book in the trilogy. But thank you for joining us today, Ross, for Book Week Scotland. It was lovely to see you and hear all about your, your writing. Thank well, you. Well, thank, thank you for speaking to me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you, anyone. Thank you, everyone, for for coming along and asking you questions and watching. And as Gillian said at the beginning, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll be able to, to meet um, in person again. Yes, here's to 2021. Okay, yeah. thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.